Austria we had this extremely expensive switch train on the Monte Verità. And, the, and I have never seen a man mounting away, but the director came, it's going to stop doing that. And I was like, you know, like the doctor that is almost killing his patient, just it's going to get away, don't worry. Okay, and you know, it's there you torn apart and it still hopes to be then it's not stopping. Oh, But again, I mean, when it's on, you really don't know. And sometimes, when it was Friday, uh, it went like this. We saw it coming from the mountains, but the wind was blowing steadily. So you could see it like... So it was five minutes, ten minutes, and then it stopped. Yeah, but it moved on. Yeah, this is why it's going And yesterday, I was sitting exactly in the middle. From that side, I could see the rosy clouds that were opening again, and the lights, so, and the ray of light, and then the other side. We had lightning and we had to switch on the lights because it didn't keep it. Because it was so dark, I was like, what's going on? So, um, this long story short. A reason to come back. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. We have a long career in front of you, so. Yeah. <laughs> Any Ricardo has to come. <laughs> yeah, show me. Let's do it. Buon pomeriggio. Buon pomeriggio e benvenute a tutte e tutti. Parlo in italiano perché poi la conversazione sarà, proseguirà in inglese. E per me è un onore molto grande poter accogliere le Nazioni Unite in questo anniversario importante. Entrambi celebriamo un anniversario importante. Perché, come diceva il signor Nasser ieri sera, ovviamente gli elicotteri passano al momento giusto. Il cinema e l'arte devono aiutarci a capire quali sono le reali emergenze, i veri problemi del nostro tempo. E ieri sera nell'intervento sul palco del dottor Nasser, dopo che hanno parlato gli interpreti di Paradise Highway, di cui qui abbiamo la promettente Hala, che ha esordito in una maniera meravigliosa tenendo testa a Juliette Binoche, no small feat, I have to say, e giustamente parlava di storytelling. Perché lo storytelling non è solo quello dei film, delle sceneggiature ben costruite come un meccanismo ad orologeria, ma è anche il modo in cui convinciamo i nostri ascoltatori, i nostri amici, i nostri collaboratori, le persone a cui intentiamo rivolgerci, che le cose di cui ci occupiamo sono importanti e che non riguardano solo noi, riguardano tutte e tutti noi. E quindi questa collaborazione la ritengo particolarmente interessante, fruttuosa e appassionante perché ci permette a entrambi di scoprire come articolare attraverso i nostri linguaggi ipotesi di collaborazione ma soprattutto strategie per avanzare a far fronte ad una serie di emergenze che non possiamo chiudere gli occhi perché di, di fronte alle quali non possiamo chiudere gli occhi perché ci occupiamo di cinema perché ci occupiamo di arte, perché l'arte che ha un senso per le società, per le nostre comunità, è l'arte che si assume le responsabilità storiche del suo tempo. E quindi io voglio ringraziare tutte e tutti voi di cuore per questa collaborazione che io mi auguro essere lunga e ricca di sorprese e che ci porti in futuro a scoprire ancora altre forme di collaborazione, per cui grazie di cuore per essere qui con noi a Locarno oggi e di nuovo grazie a lei per aver condiviso con noi la serata di ieri. E a voi e tutte, a voi tutti, grazie per partecipare a questo incontro, è la dimostrazione che questi temi hanno 
un'attenzione da parte del pubblico e che possono dar vita a delle conversazioni e quindi a delle strategie per andare avanti. Grazie, buon pomeriggio, buon lavoro. Grazie mille, grazie mille Giona per queste tue parole. Thank you so much uh, and uh, welcome to you everybody. Uh, you are maybe asking yourself uh, what uh, we have in common around this table. Uh, a civil servant working for the United Nations in New York, a young, very young actress, and a producer, not a normal producer, not a usual producer, a special producer, producer you will understand why. Uh, what, what brings us together around this table? And uh, the, the starting idea was uh, the 20 years of Switzerland belonging to the UN. Uh, Switzerland was a, is a country which uh, um, decided um, quite, quite, quite late to, to join the UN 20 years ago. We, uh, Switzerland is the only country in the world who voted with a popular vote to decide to join the UN. And um, this, uh, this year is a, it's an important anniversary for Switzerland, 20 years, uh, an, an important anniversary for, for the film festival, 75 years. And so we're starting thinking about how can we celebrate these two anniversary together. United Nations are very important for Switzerland because we are a small country. We cannot uh, fight pandemics, uh, manage migration, uh, fight poverty by ourselves as a country. We have to work together with the other countries and we do it in the United Nations. So um, my first question is to uh, Mayer Nasser. What brings uh, a, civil servant, a civ civil servant working in New York at the United Nations to Locarno? numbers, and we hear about casualties of war and conflict, 
actually what science and social studies have shown is that as more people die, the less people care. You remember the first victims that you see on television? And then you hear, oh, another five died, another 10 were killed, another 20, et cetera, et cetera. You become numb. But if it's a story of one person, it makes a difference. So storytelling and the power of storytelling is why we have sought a partner and work with the creative community to address those issues, whether it's the issues of peace, justice, human rights, climate change, inequality, and the sustainable development goals have actually given us a platform that really touches on every aspect of life. So in short, I'm sorry it's a long answer, but that's why I'm here. <laughs> But you say, uh, Maher, you say the partnering with uh, the creative industry. Uh, what does it mean exactly? I mean, the United Nations are a place where country comes together and discuss issues. And how can you partner with uh, with cinema, with uh, with the creative industry? Well, actually, the word partnership. Sometimes our legal department tells us you can't do partnership unless you have a written agreement. So we say collaboration and sometimes partnerships. But <laughs> we, we we offer stories. And we have collaborated with a number of filmmakers, television productions, where they started working on a story based on uh, inspiration from something that happened in a peacekeeping mission or in, 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 in a colleague of ours who is an expert on climate change advising small island states. Documentaries are a direct and easy collaboration. With a documentary, you provide access to experts. They are interviewed or senior UN officials, access to documentation, the audiovisual archives that we have, which goes back to 1945. Some of the documentation even goes back to the League of Nations, which the Geneva hosted, and the Vienna, uh, after Austria, the Switzerland hosted. Uh, so that, that is one aspect of it. Many productions, they sometimes, the story is not coming from us, but it's based on the book or another story, and the story includes filming in the United Nations or having the UN name or a peacekeeping appear in the film. So for that, they come to us and we start talking, we look at the test, and we give them feedback. Well, actually, this is not how things happen. And you know, you have to really, to be realistic, this is not, and we work with that, and then we sometimes sign a location agreement, so that's another level of cooperation. But also, as part of that, as the marketing campaign for that production happens, we agree, well, can we do messaging around, let's say the film is about, that touches on the issue of human trafficking, like, like uh, how can we do messaging, and what can people do? Where, which country is the victim going to, and is there a hotline that can be pushed out? It's a film about climate change. What can individuals do? Uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a kind of the other aspect of collaboration. A third is that there are films, whether we have collaborated with them or not, they might touch on something that is on the UN's agenda. So we organized a screening at the UN and a discussion with the film production team and some experts from the UN. And that in itself, there is value. I know the UN isn't perfect, we never say it is, but it is the world's number one international and most represented organization. And everybody wants to be seen as having done something at the United Nations, whether it's the an art exhibit or a film screen, so that also, is there interest in that always? But we have to make it natural and authentic. We can't just make up a reason for showing something without really working with the, with the different elements in, in the film. And at the same time, as we move forward, it's not just about raising the issue, but how can this change something? How can it change people's minds and change behavior and lead to action that will actually help reduce a suffering or a problem impacting somewhere or somewhere else. Hala, uh, we saw you yesterday as the main character together with Juliette Binoche uh, in a film against uh, the human trafficking, one of the issues that the United Nations are fighting very strongly. So you didn't know you worked in, in practically direct way for the United Nations, helping them raising this, uh, this issue. You weren't aware of this, I, I imagine. But my question to you is, uh, um, which was your motivation 
to play in such a film, which is tough. I mean, human trafficking is, is really awful, and, and it, it must be tough for a young girl as you to, 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 to play in, in such a film. I would say my motivation to film this movie was or is to protect other girls from going through the same thing that Layla went through. So you were working for the United Nations together with the <laughs> United Nations without knowing it. Fantastic. I would say we're working for humanity because it's not working about the United humanity. Nations. I mean, when it's we say we, it's like the issues, <laughs> we are about the issues and the people that we serve. We're not about the organization. Yes, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, your performance yesterday was, uh, I, I was really, really impressed. You did it Thank very, you. very well. And um, you did it also thanks to producer that uh, who wants to produce films but not every kind of film what kind of film do you produce claudia well a lot of the a lot of the work that we do are actually that we are really looking to produce films that can have an impact and that uh, can create an emotion in the viewer that people are more aware of certain issues, themes that we believe need changing. Like, you know, people need to be aware of human trafficking. People need to be aware of, you know, what torture does to people. People need to be aware of, you know, climate change, drone warfare, and all these things. So, um, and we believe that, at, you know, we believe that what Maher said, you're changing the world. You can think a lot and you can make rational decisions. But what really makes you change if there's something that really impacts your emotion. If it gets you, then that's what's changing. And that you can actually do through storytelling in film or a series, because you can reach people on a different level than what you can do just by you know, statistics. And um, that's something that we've been done for a while. And um, it's, uh, it is actually something that is really close to our heart and um, if that means that we can basically just save one girl from that fate the movie already is a success <laughs> right if there's awareness if people are suddenly realizing this can actually happen just anywhere you know in the united states or in europe and they are they're more aware of that because everybody just always thinks that's far away from me that's somewhere else well, it's not. Everything is happening right around us, and we need to be aware, and we need to change things, and, and that's kind of like the goal of these films. Hala, how could you get into the skin of a child, like the one, the main character of your film, uh, a child with a lot of huge problem in a terrible situation? How could you get into the skin of, the, of this, uh, this child? Well, I was very mildly aware of trafficking when I read the script. But once, once I read the script, I just absolutely fell in love with it. And I thought it was really important to tell the story. Um, I mean, I, I just thought that I'm sorry, I'm gathering my words. It's, it's, it's not very um, not bad. But, um, <laughs> once I read the script, I just thought it was so important and I just had to do it. I mean, a lot of preparations went into just researching trafficking or watching documentaries or even movies based on true events. But I thought some of the films I watched were a little exploitive and I loved that honest script was not focused on that, that it was more just implied in the story. Um, I also, I wanted to portray a real life person in the situation and uh, its after effects. So online I would watch like um, therapy sessions of people who had trauma pretty much, uh, just for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also Layla's life and how Layla grew up. 
her home life and the people around her probably may influence her, like how she deals with situations she's put in. So I had to think about that as well. There's just a lot of things to prepare for, and I had to really immerse myself into Layla's world, I'd say. Um, just learning about the things she knew from how to shoot a gun to having to deal with foster homes and a mother who was an addict. So it was a lot of intense work, but just being able to bring that character to life was so fun. I wonder how you did it very well. <laughs> Maya, your reaction? No, I, it's, uh, it's hard. Act, acting is hard, I think. It's, and, and I think you did the right thing in, in the preparation is how would a girl who had these circumstances be like? And I think you, you aced it. Thank you. Well, I mean, to, to, to let the people feel how victims can feel is also a, a powerful uh, tool to raise awareness, Claudia. Um, yes, but it's also a, it's also really, um, it's a really fine line because like Hala said, you don't want to exploit it. You know, you don't want to exploit, you know, because people are victims, you don't want to exploit them. That's the same thing. And on the other hand, and what you also want to do is you want to get people to really look at the screen and not want to look away from the screen, <laughs> right? And that's the difficulties with these films is you, you their documentaries are incredibly important for information. But if you want to reach a broader audience, and if you want to create awareness also that's you know, more global, and you want to start a discussion in society about certain things, you very often don't do that through a documentary, because you're just not going to have that reach. Um, and um, that is you know, to get it in a way that is also entertaining, and people really want to watch it. <laughs> That's the fine line, and for that, you know, you need a great. Whoops. You need to develop the script. You need to have the right director, and you have to have amazing actors who actually are really making it their own. And I mean, it was incredibly brave of Hala and Julia to jump into these characters and also very, very hard because it's such a tough subject matter and portraying it in such an authentic way that actually as an audience, people are watching it and they really believe in it and they can feel what it would mean to be in that situation and that hopefully they're not just going out of the film later on and it's just another film, but hopefully they go out and it stays with them and they look at their environments more carefully and they actually action something when they feel like this is weird, you know, that there's something going on that's not right. Mm. Maya, uh, a word which is very important for you is the word hope. Can you elaborate mm -hmm. on it? Uh, I think maybe just hope. I mean, when you mention victims, I think some people prefer to call survivors mm -hmm. rather than vic a victim it becomes inactive, but a survivor can actually move on and maybe help others get over the same, the same issue. Uh, in, in, in all of our own experiences, our own lives, and any situation that you come across, if you are desperate and you don't think you're going to not, you're not gonna make it, you will not make it. But if you decide that, no, there is a window, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that, you eventually succeed. Um, hope, I think it's probably humanity's best invention because it's what motivates us to move. Some people ask them what is the best invention, some people will tell you the wheel, the fire, the use of fire, others will tell you this, uh, but I could say probably the glasses, but I would say it's hope because hope is, is why now we think, yes, we have all of these crises, but we look back and we see successes, successes that happened 
in our lifetime when governments, private sector, the United Nations came together and addressed an issue, tackled it straight on, and moved forward. In the 1980s, there was the ozone layer depletion. Everybody was talking about, we're doomed. We're all going to die with skin cancer because we are using these chemicals. And then, of course, scientists looked at it and said, well, wait a minute. These hydrofluorocarbons, we can find alternatives. We don't have to use those for refrigeration, for aerosols. So there was the Montreal Protocols signed in 1989. And governments put in new regulation. Industry complied. And today, we can say that the ozone layer is healing. And that's a success story. And it wouldn't have happened if we didn't come together with regulation, but also government compliance. And it was people who pushed that. Today, we talk about climate change. We have the Paris Agreement, which gives us hope that if governments and the private sector and everybody work together, we can stay within the one and a half degree, which, which in itself is bad. But it's better, it's better than two degrees. It's better than three degrees. And to, to think that if we're just going to say, no, we're not going to do it. Look how hot it is in, in Locarno. But uh, it's not usually. But we won't do that. So we have to have that hope to build the future where everyone thrives in peace, justice, equality on a healthy planet. So what, when I look back, and some people have argued, this is the best time to be human. In all of our history, in the thousands and tens of thousands of humanity, we have the longest lifespan expectation. We have the lowest infant mortality on maternal mortality. We have the highest income generally across the world. It has risen. At the same time, it's the worst time to be another species. We have led hundreds of species to extinction. There's a challenge that we are witnessing the sixth largest extinction, that between now and the end of the century, more than a million species could go extinct. The climate is changing, oceans are acidification, and it's all we know from science. It's because of our own actions and our own activities. We have become addicted to fossil fuels. It is time to break from that addiction. And that is not going to be easy, but it's possible. Because we see the cost of renewable energy today is a fraction of what it was 10 years ago. When people 10 years ago told them, we're going to replace coal, oil, with solar and wind, people said, no way. That's too expensive. It's not going to happen. Now, it's actually cheaper. Renewables are much cheaper in the long run, and they have no impact on, on society. We have the pandemic. Everybody was worried because historically, it takes 10 to 12 years to develop a vaccine. That's what we know from history. But because of the determination and the collaboration across borders with scientists and the World Health Organization and the industry, we developed multiple vaccines in nine months. That was incredible. Of course, there was resistance. There was pushback. The vaccines don't work. Well, actually, they do work. They have reduced the number of people who have died. Yes, you might still get COVID if you are vaccinated, but you will not be hospitalized. 95% you will not be hospitalized. There are some cases, of course. There are exceptions. So that gives me hope. And on a personal level, I mean, it's, I, I liken it to running a marathon. I grew up, I never ran. I hate running. The, the, the few times I ran when I was young is to catch a bus or to run from soldiers in a demonstration. But I decided to run the New York City Marathon. Now, if I didn't start with the hope that I can finish it, I would never finish it. And I don't know if you have tried to run a marathon, but your body will hate you for it. But if, unless you have hope, you will not finish it. <laughs> I see. I see. Hala, you are 13 years old. May I ask you, uh, when you look at the world, uh, which things most, you are most worried of? Uh, 
I don't know, climate change, war, pandemic. Uh, what's your main concern if you look at this world today? Well, what's my main concern of what's going on in the world today? Well, there are a lot of issues going on in the world, so I would say that they're all important to fix. Um, If you, if you should imagine I asking Claudia for, for the next film, I want to make a film on, I don't know, uh, <laughs> against climate change or uh, what could be your dream? I guess maybe world war, I mm -hmm. guess, because I think it'd be really nice for everyone to live in peace instead of constantly fighting over dumb things. I must mm -hmm. say yesterday, when I saw the end of the film, and you are, maybe not you, Leila, going away with, uh, with this wonderful woman driving a truck, I was so happy. I could have stand another, another end, uh, a bad end, I could have stand it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <yeah. laughs> uh, Claudia, uh, and, and, and for you, I, it's not your first film of this kind of films uh, uh, with, with the goal of raise awareness. Uh, you did other films on other issues, very important issues. Um, can you tell us how did you choose these issues and what's next? Uh -huh. um. Well, it's always, you know, um, it, it's always a combination. It, it's not that, you know, it's not that I'm saying this is the issue we want to do right now. It's more of a, you know, what is, what is it that we're talking about? And um, I guess the bigger theme is the question, um, we know we can learn as individuals, and the question is, can we learn as a society? Oops, sorry. Can we learn as a society? And what are the issues that we as a society need to learn? And I really do believe through creating these kind of films or series um, that as a society we can learn. So it's, it's always about, you know, what is pressing, but it's then also there's coming a script to us or developing a script and it needs to come together. Um, and it comes in different ways, you know, like Anna Gutu came to us with this script and we were like, okay, you know, a, a friend of mine, Clint Close, we did a movie about gender equality called The Wife. Won her the Golden Globe, and we got like an Oscar nomination and so on. And she had a, um, she she said to me, Claudia, the definition of an independent film is a film that almost doesn't get made. <laughs> <laughs> now think about a film about first-time director about human trafficking, child sex trafficking, as well as female truckers. <laughs> Not a film that necessarily a lot of studios go like, yes, let's do this movie. Um, so, so, um, so you really have to put your mind and your heart in it, and you really need to think that it's an important subject matter you really want to tackle, and that you probably know that 99% of the people out there wouldn't even try, um, because they think it would be way too hard. And so uh, that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why we did this. We do have in development a film about climate change as well. But that, again, is a very, very tough um, subject matter to tackle because what are you showing? It's very hard to show, you know, climate change in a film, um, you know, because it doesn't really impact you immediately. It's, 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 you know, it's climate change. It's huge. How do you get it down into a script and into a way to tell a story that you can actually get people to really engage with it. It's not, that's a really hard task. So we're trying to be, we're trying to tackle this. We've been trying to do this for a long time right now and eventually we're gonna get the script right and eventually we're gonna be able to do it. Um, and it's also about, um, I, I think that's also another thing. You need to then convince a lot of the stakeholders that they are also buying into um, doing that film, right? So it's not, it, that's not an easy task. And a lot of the stakeholders usually go, yeah, what's the film? How much do I put in and how much do I make? 
And so it's also a constant education um, and a constant convincing of people that money is just one currency. There are other currencies, and those currencies are incredibly important for us as a society and for humanity and for humankind, and that currency can't be just money. It needs to be the impact and the change that we have in a positive way. And so the different subject matters have different people that you can um, convince, and that will then also you know, invest in the subject matter. But I guess that's a very long answer. Um, but climate change is another one that we are that's on our radar right now and that we've actually developed for a long time and I think that's going to be one of the next that we are doing. When we prepared this conversation yesterday, uh, one of the, of the points of discussion was uh, uh, um, raise awareness, is it enough, not enough, it's a goal but we have to do more than just raise awareness. Maher, what's your opinion on it? I think it's always important to raise awareness, but we are at a point where, to what purpose? If we want people to learn to read and write so that they can read books and they can learn from those. So if you raise awareness without also a concrete plan of what you can direct people to take action to, then you have only achieved half of the, of the purpose. So in our communication strategies today, when we try to develop something, we try to say, okay, what next? What do we want to offer people the opportunity to do? Whether they are individuals, whether they are policymakers, whether they are from collaborators in the industry and, 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 and the rest of it. And I think that's always very important. And what, when we say what can people do, it's not just individuals and what you can yourself do like, oh, I want to reduce my carbon footprint, or I will eat less red meat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I will. These are your own individual choices, but that can only really impact your own immediate surrounding. It's not going to stop the big fossil fuel companies from digging more to get more coal, more oil, and burning it and and fueling the the runaway climate change. So there's the second aspect is that. We are now living in an interconnected world, so our individual actions include the way we also hold politicians and leaders accountable, whether they are in government or whether they are in the private sector. So each and every one of us has two votes, at least in countries where you have elections and democracies. If you can vote to, and then you can see which politicians are really addressing the issues that you care about, and then maybe, okay, I'll put them in office, and the companies are also now with social media, and I think they do a lot of research on what Gen Z is thinking about, what uh, millennials are thinking about, and it is now becoming evident that they see that young people, especially today with what they have access to, they are basing their purchase choices and whether they're buying a service or a, a product on how much that company's ethos really aligns with mine. Does it stand for the ethics that, that they are saying themselves? Are they greenwashing or are they sincere? Are they really saying, you know, I am an oil company and I want to finance an expedition to the North Pole to save the bears at the same time I'm investing $200 million in digging oil wells and burning? That's, that's hypocrisy. The Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, uh, on Monday said, or uh, he, he was presenting a report on the global crisis of food, energy. Fossil fuel companies last month, I think, announced that they have made $100 billion in profit in the first quarter of this year. That's when tens of millions of people have been pushed to poverty, pushed to desperation, displaced, and can't afford the next meal. And these companies are still pushing for more uh, permits to continue to pollute, and they are also hiring lobbyists and PR companies to forestall regulation that will necessitate that they clean up what they have done. So we, every person needs to push again in that direction. So hold these country account, companies accountable. That 
is an important action, as are important individual actions. So we have a campaign called Act Now in the UN, which suggests 10 actions that people can do to reduce their carbon footprint. And one of those is speak up. And speaking up can be through the advocation, advocacy for the policymakers, whether they are private or public, to really adapt and adopt policies that are sincere and have an impact on changing the course that we're on. Claudia, your films are a way to speak up. Yes, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will ask the audience if, the, if there is any question. Uh, we will start with the gentleman. Oh, thank you. Um, I would like to know how storytelling changes in social media. The many young people don't necessarily watch TV or long movies anymore, but are more on social media, and you have to communicate with reels, much shorter, maybe uh, things. How does that change storytelling? Who wants to answer? Well, Hello. Mala, you are the youngest here. <laughs> <laughs> the, qu the question was what do what do you what do you uh, you are on social media I can imagine what the most interesting things you see on social media for you as a, as a 13 years old girl what are you interested in well, on social media, um, well, since there is a lot more people on social media, I guess, I would like to see more people spreading awareness. Um, I mean, the more awareness we can spread, the more chance there is of stopping all these issues going on in the world, especially trafficking even. I mean, even if because even if you see something slightly off, some people might think, oh, it's probably fine, but no matter what, you should speak up because you could end up saving someone's life. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think the principle is the same. Historically, stories were told verbally. Then when writing was invented, we started reading, writing and reading the stories, uh, first in stones and then on paper, and then came audio stories and then radio, television. So whether it's long form or short form, a TikTok is a story. Um, a Vine, which is even shorter before, which disappeared now, but that was the first video form. Twitter, we tell stories. I mean, uh, we tweet, we tell stories, we put st Facebook posts or Instagram or whichever uh, social media, it's, it's, the concept is the same, and this is why some, of, some are more successful than others. So you have somebody who's really smart and clever in, in using their Instagram account suddenly, or YouTube channel, boop, 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 millions, and now, now you hear about young people who have making tens of thousands a month and millions because they have 10 million followers, and they are you know, using that to commercial deals with, uh, with companies and brands. So the concept is the same. It's just the medium has changed. The storytelling, it can be long, it can be short. But I think young people are still also watching films. But they're watching them maybe on a smaller screen, screen and they're not necessarily going to the cinema as often. But they're still watching. Claudia, uh, which is the importance of social media in your work as a producer? Well, I mean, as a producer, you choose different medias, right? So I did choose the, I guess, long form in terms of, you know, series as well as films. Um, and I mean, as Maher said, a good story is a good story and you will always have certain things that, you know, make that story. <laughs> um, for us then social media and on the distribution side is more a way to reach out and, you know, maybe you take clips of your and trailer moments and so on and to communicate with the audience just through those channels. But obviously there is a different way to, you know, to 
to create short stories or clips or social media stories and communicate, which is not something that we necessarily do. Um, there's only so much you can do in your life. <laughs> and I chose to be, you know, to do that on, on you know, for, as film and then television, and that's more of a long form because I feel that's how we can really, you know, bring over the emotion and tell the stories that we want to tell. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of influencers out there and so on who do their own stories and on TikTok and so on, and that is, um, that is just a different channel of communication. It doesn't really, if your question was, how does it change um, our work? Um, I don't see that really changing our work so much. You know, developing, developing a good story and a good script um, takes about 10 to 11 years, normally, at least. Um, um, it needs time. It re really does need time. Sometimes you can be a bit faster. Let's say it's five years. You're super fast, right? So that's obviously a huge different to, difference to, yeah, I'm going and I'm making this short clip on, you know, whatever it is, TikTok, or all of that is important. And all of that is important that we have people out there who also um, have a certain va set of values um, uh, and is not just about displaying yourself and you know not just being like that. But I, for me, my work, it doesn't really change. Take another question of the lady with the white dress. If you can give her a, mic a microphone, please. Um, hello, I'm Marta. I'm a public defender and human rights teacher in Brazil who is trying arts to pass a message. And um, I have a question after those last two speech discussions that we had here. The first one, we talked about um, how hard it is now for um, move directors to reach the audience because of the streaming. There, is, there are companies who selected, and um, I think we, we all can agree that they are not very interested in human rights issues. They are more interested about entertainment. So that's um, the first hard thing after you do ho the whole process of doing an independent movie that's really hard to end, passing a message, having some quality, and then you stop because um, most of people in the world are from poor countries who can't afford to pay the tickets for the movies that will be even more expensive with this energy crisis. So the question is, could you give a hope <laughs> to the directors who want to give a message that somehow the United Nations is, uh, have a program or have this discussion about how to distribute the movie because it's not about making. Uh, about my experience, I'm telling you, it's not about making. Maybe without any money, with good uh, friends who knows how to do it, you can do the whole movie. Yes, you can. And then what? Because people will not see it. They are so busy in the TikTok, seeing people dancing, and how to reach those people who can't afford to pay the ticket to see a movie, because Thank that's you. the message of the movies, right? Thank you for your Thank question. You. Maya, do you want to react? I, I mean, there, there are different views about the streaming services. Some, some actually would tell you that it has democratized the access because you don't necessarily have to rely on the big distributing companies or a film being in the theater. And there are now, people often use Netflix, but now you have like five others or six other streaming services in multiple countries. So there, there, there are two sides to this debate. And many filmmakers, you always think of your audience. Any, any, any campaign, any communication, any story, is it, does it, is it relevant for this audience? And which is the audience that I want to reach? If your audience, you want to think to every person in the world, then you haven't really thought about your audience. 
So what is the audience that you want and how and what is the best way that you will get that product to them? And then you can probably find a distribution that is specialized in that niche for that specific audience that, that you're concerned with. Uh, I, think, I think most people who are disadvantaged, nobody needs to tell them that their rights are being taken. They know that. The thing is, how do you show them how to take them back? Claudia, do you want to add something? Yeah, not an easy subject matter. Um, to a certain extent, you have a much better chance today to get distributed widely and, and actually reach a global, global audience. Um, you know, I mean, we've been very lucky that you know, we always had partners and we were always actually able to find partners pretty much in every single country in the world, except you know, countries where there's a lot of censorship. Um, which is difficult then. Um, I mean, you could argue that um, you could argue that uh, you know, with social media and everything, you have a better chance of actually reaching an audience and 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 finding those ways of distribution. But I would say that uh, I'm seeing that myself. That a lot of independent companies, and you say, you know, what are, what what is with these independent distributors? And they are struggling right now because people do not actually go even to the cinema so I mean that's a one step away from you because you say people don't have the money to buy the cinema ticket well that effect is that you know all these smaller independent distributors they don't get that money and that means they actually can't buy films and it's like it's the circle in the moment right and to be honest I have no answer um, how that is going to change um, uh, we will, a lot of the films, even a lot of the films that I think I, I have done over the last 10, 15 years, I'm not quite sure if we could get them done today in this, in this day and age because the independent distributors, the independent companies who buy these kind of films, they are all struggling after the pandemic. So, um, but on the other side, talking with Maha about hope. <laughs> um, I, I also do believe that like a good content and, and will always find its way to its audience. I mean, I just believe in that. And, and you always find ways to get it out to the audience that needs it. And sometimes, to be honest, that takes five to 10 years. I mean, we were seeing Jason Blum yesterday, you know, he got that Laudatio. Well, what he didn't say is that that movie he picked up, he didn't produce it in 20, and he picked it up, and it, he, was, he was amazing because he picked this film up that nobody wanted to show, and he was actually able to get you know, DreamWorks to show it, and then it became this huge success. But that movie was sitting there for, a, for many years, and nobody wanted to distribute it. <laughs> so it's not like, you know, it's not like it's got to be instant. You know, it, if you, if you create the right content and you're persistent enough, um, it will fill its, it, it will like find its audience. I, I really believe in that, um, but I can't really give you a straight answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think we have time for a last question. The gentleman, Daniel, sorry, it was before you. Yeah, a technical question to Claudia. At the end of the movie, you have Morgan Freeman as a rogue policeman being positive. I have problems with that as a decision. Uh, did you hesitate? Uh, it fit into the end of the movie, but to glorify a rogue policeman to me was problematic. <laughs> well, you have a, are you saying that we should have portrayed him as a baddie? The concept of a rogue policeman today is usually negative, and we're trying to get law and order. In fact, he's going to be above the law. That's my point. He's making a personal yeah. decision that, in effect, someone could say is lawless. I believe in, I, I believe in institutions. I believe in the United Nations. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I also believe in the law, don't get me wrong, but I also believe that sometimes, I also believe in self-responsibility in making decisions, and I have been myself in situations where I was like, holy crap, that system really fucks up, 
And, um, and then I believe that we do have a self-responsibility that we can also make certain decisions. As long as we are okay than to live with the consequences. The consequences for him going rogue could be that he goes to jail. If he's fine with that, and if he's not lying about that, and he's transparent because they said, hey, shit's gonna hit the fucking fan, and you know that's what's gonna happen. But he said, it's okay, I'm gonna take that responsibility, and he shielded Cameron Monaghan's, you know, Sterling's character of it because he didn't want to ruin his life. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's a cultural question and it's a question of your choice, but I actually think sometimes you make a decision if you really feel that's the right decision consciously um, and it's not always necessarily completely in line with maybe what's in that moment, that system. So yes, it is a conscious decision. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you so much, uh, Maher. A huge thanks to you, Hala, for your talent, for your film, Paradise Highway, that I really appreciate it. Um, I think we, can, we could go on discussing about these uh, issues uh, uh, for many hours still. We will maybe do it uh, next year at the <laughs> festival, again, with more developments, I hope so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to the audience. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to moderate this day. Well, thank you.